Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm excited today to uh, give you a keynote talk about theory. Uh, mostly I'm excited because if you're here, you probably already are interested in theory. Um, and so that's really great. I really appreciate E&E &E inviting me to give this keynote. Um, it's great again to be here. One of the things that he asked me to do in preparing this talk was to talk from my perspective as somebody who is trained in the behavioral sciences more than in the computer sciences. And so part of this perspective that you hear is what happens when a behavioral scientist meets computer science and then tries to make sense of what the theory is um, and, and how it exists. And it actually started with a, a, a discussion I had once with Bruce Croft at ECIR in 2009. I had just finished uh, this huge systematic review of literature, it was about 40 years of literature, and I was very disappointed that I didn't really find a lot of theory. So I was at a break, and I approached Bruce, and I said, Bruce, why are, where isn't there any theory in IR? And he said, well, Diane, there is some theory. We have these uh, ranking models, we have uh, BM25, we have um, all of these other kinds of retrieval models, and they all have some theory, somebody's idea about relevance built in. So I said, okay, that's good. So kind of got me started looking at things differently. So these may be the kinds of theoretical models you're mostly um, used to seeing or presented. And so all, again, all of these models represent somebody's idea of what relevance is. So they capture and symbolically represent this idea of relevance, because that's what the main task is, is for a lot of retrieval, is trying to retrieve documents that are going to be relevant to what the person is interested in seeing. So there is theory around, and theory often looks like this, mathematical expression. And this is only one type of, one way to express theory. Theory can actually be expressed in a lot of different ways, and some of those I'll show you in just a minute. In the behavioral sciences, theory is often expressed as words, but also there's a lot of math and symbolic um, representation as well. Here's another example of some theory from our field. So this is the probability ranking principle for interactive information retrieval by Wilbert Furr. And what you see is part of his theory, he's even established a vocabulary to be able to talk about and present this theory. Um, he also, you'll see this faintly highlighted segment of text um, he also is really specific about what the theory covers and what it explains and what it doesn't. So this ranking principle is just about the system, and that's what the system knows, but it does not necessarily involve the user, except insofar as the user is providing input to the system. But it doesn't try to account for the user's mental model or, or um, idea about what it is they're looking for. We also have user models for evaluation. So you see on one side RBP, uh, this is Moffitt and Zobel's um, work where uh, there is some model of the user. And earlier measures, uh, evaluation measures, actually were pretty, had pretty impoverished or missing models of users. It was just a matter of how do we count things, how do we decide which algorithm is best. Um, not so much as like what is the user actually trying to do. And so then now we see more and more of these measures incorporate user models that do all sorts of interesting things like model decay, um, time, um, patients, um, impatience, um, and so forth. The other side there you see um, an example of a lot of work, huge work uh, that's been done developing click models and user models for ranking. And so this again is just one, one early example of that work that also tries to incorporate some representation of what the user is doing, what the user's decision making process is to actually drive uh, the ranking. We also have a lot of simulation in our field, um, and so this is just one example here, um, some work by Cal Jarwell and others um, to do simulation. And so simulations are actually types of theory or theoretical constructs. Um, in this particular case, this work was trying to um, simulate, um, uh, I don't know if it was a million, I can't remember what the number actually was, but a whole lot of users. And so what you see here is just a rule set for how queries uh, would be produced by these, sim these simulated users um, in their model. 
And of course, there's a lot of other simulations that are used in a lot of other fields, including physical simulations where there's actual physical environments that people are moving around in. You can think about even things like um, um, pilots and flying airplanes. So there's often simulation, simulators for that type of work. Then we have uh, work that borrows from other fields. And so the example here that I'm choosing is, is Lake as a party's work that tries to incorporate and use economic models to explain interactive IR. So this is another place where theory is being used, and in particular, theoretical tools and ideas from other fields of being imported in to try to explain what's going on uh, when a user is searching, try to explain why they go so far in a search results list and then stop and decide to query again or decide to end their search task. And again, these models in particular really are trying to focus on explaining what's going on, not just describing it. This is another example. Um, this is work by Enrique Amido and others um, that was at SIGIR in 2018. It's a fantastic paper uh, that uses formal analysis and it also looks at evaluation measures. And so what you see on the left is just a clip of where they, they set up an, an, analytical, an axiom, a analytical procedure based on axioms and evaluated the common evaluation measures we have and then they use that to create a new evaluation measure. And what was common in this work and what you'll see in some work um, in IR that is theory, you'll see uh, these formal uh, process to go through and evaluate proofs. So the work may start with axioms, may build theorems from axioms and then actually um, have sort of formal proofs. In this particular paper, all that comes in the appendix, which is kind of nice for a person like me. Um, but that's another type of theoretical work we have in our field. We also have and use uh, theories as metaphors. So neural networks, of course, is something that's on probably a lot of people's mind in here. And that's a metaphor that actually helps us understand and do something. It's a theoretical <coughs> construct in the sense that there is not an actual physical uh, neural network, but it's a model that helps us understand something. There's also a couple of uh, famous ones from information science. There's Bates's very picky model, uh, which describes how people interact with information in a system, which was actually very uh, revolutionary at the time it was proposed, because in the past, or at the time it was proposed, the assumption was that people had a query and that the idea was this there was one query and there was one set of documents and that was the objective of the system to retrieve that set of documents what this model proposed was that it's actually an iterative process and when a person sees documents they get ideas that help sharpen or change what it is they think they're looking for and that might result in a different query and a different set of documents and so rather than thinking about sending out one set one list of people this model actually said no actually people do need to look at multiple lists of things because as they're searching um, their, their thinking is changing the other model that I uh, showed here is some work by Peter Perilli that's on information forging theory so again that's a metaphor um, the ones out actually the physical world as this person is. Uh, it comes from also food related metaphor. But this particular theory actually is, is pretty advanced and developed. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, theoretical tools in the form of um, equations and so forth to help researchers try to explain and understand different phenomena. And in this case, he spent a lot of time applying this theory to information seeking and information search. And this is another theory uh, that people in information retrieval have tried to use to try to explain what's going on. We also have descriptive models. And so these, if you can't read them, don't worry. Um, you can always look them up. The one on the left is a, one by Ingerson and Jarvelin uh, in their book, The Turn. And this is, again, a theoretical construct that you may not immediately recognize as being theory, but this is how theory sometimes shows up in our field. And these are, this is just a model of, um, of the world of information seeking. And so it has different layers that go all the way out to social context, environmental context, um, and different um, stratas. It's not necessarily a theory or model that one could derive hypotheses from um, and go out and test them. So it just really helps us see what the boundaries of, are that we're studying. The other descriptive model, which again is, can be considered a theoretical construct, 
is actually a, a system description. And so this is just a, a diagram showing the different parts of this system called Emerson Bot um, that Eugene and others are working on at Emory right now. So again, it's not necessarily intended to produce hypotheses, but it is a the type of theoretical construct that helps us reason about the world. And it is one that we did use on a fairly typical basis. Then the last one I wanted to share, um, these are two uh, that kind of come from the user world. Um, the first one is uh, Bertie Brooks's fundamental, fundamental Equation of IR, which is actually a pretty simple equation. Um, what you see for the first term is actually the, the knowledge of a person or the knowledge state at some time. And then you add this different information that the person didn't have in their knowledge state, and that results in some new knowledge state that the person has. So it's a pretty basic, again, idea uh, that, that is just represented symbolically here. And then the second one there is something called ASK, um, which Nick says it's a hypothesis, not a theory. Uh, but you can see that as well. And that's something that a lot of people kind of take as a primitive or take as a given when they actually are designing systems that people are in these uh, what are called anonymous states of knowledge where they're using the system often because they don't know what they're looking for. And so that creates an interesting situation if you're trying to design a system that's supposed to help elicit um, what that need is so that you can then go off and retrieve documents, for example, to satisfy that need. So a lot of these things then function really as just, again, what people assume or are given that are implied in a lot of research, not necessarily cited as, this is what I believe. So given that I've just showed you all this theory in IR research, um, you may be totally satisfied that there's plenty of theory in information retrieval research. Uh, but still, we often are standing around wondering, why isn't there more theory in information retrieval research? Where is the theory in information research? Uh, so what I want to do now is sort of look up and think about um, and maybe speculate a little bit about why people often are dissatisfied uh, with, the, with the amount of theory that's in information retrieval research. So to do that, I want to start just um, showing you kind of a basic model of scientific research. And again, this one is heavily informed by the behavioral sciences, so it may not be something that, that you, if you train in computer science, you necessarily learned um, as a student. Um, but what you see here uh, are actually three layers. Um, there's the empirical, symbolic, and theoretical layer. Um, in each of those layers, different things are going on. The theoretical level, of course, is the highest level of abstraction. Uh, and then the symbolic level is the, the level where we as researchers translate those ideas or theories that we have into some kind of language that could be mathematical, it could be just words, um, could be diagrams, some kind of language that helps us communicate those theoretical ideas um, to other people. So it sort of starts to make it visible. And then at the empirical level, that's where we actually go out and do observation, gather data to try to test out those ideas that we have. Um, those ideas may be in the form of hypotheses that we generated from the theories or models, um, or it may just be that we're out and we have access to a lot of data, and so we decide we're going to analyze it. What I want to point out is um, generalizability. Um, builds up over time, so it's not something that's typically um, obtained by doing a single study in this model of science. It's something that's, that is accumulative over time as more and more studies are done about a particular topic and as a theory or idea is exercised more and more in different ways by different people. The other thing that you'll notice on this diagram is these the words over here on the side uh, where at the empirical level, we can describe things. We can describe what we see. We can talk about, for example, how many queries a person injured, how many clicks they made, or how long it took them to make a click. At the symbolic level, the work there actually allows us to make predictions. So we might be able to predict, given this particular uh, observation, the chances are this next thing is going to happen. So we do a lot of prediction in our field and are pretty good at it. And then at the top level, that's where the explanation actually comes in. So not just uh, talking and describing and predicting when a person is going to click, but actually explaining why that's the case. And this is the level that we spend the least amount of time on because a lot of times the, the, um, our incentives 
um, are not necessarily geared around our working at this level, our incentive structures, whether it's in because we're an industry researcher or even academic researcher, our incentive structure is actually um, centered around the empirical level. So what often happens is, this is what our research looks like. Um, so we collect a lot of data, we do a lot of studies, we measure a lot of things, but we never actually link any of that stuff back to theory or theoretical constructs or ideas. And that's why um, you may have, at times, feelings that nothing is accumulating, nothing is growing at that theoretical level. Now, I'm going to be a little more generous, um, even though I think that picture is funny. Um, I'll be a little bit more generous because I think our research looks a little bit more like this, um, where we are doing a lot of work at the symbolic level. Certainly, there's some fantastic models that people in this room have created and others as well that are used to um, do a lot of positive things. Um, sell people things, retrieve things, recommend things, um, all of that. But we're still not working very much at the theory level. And so the other thing that I want to point out here, and I'm not sure if you can actually see it, but the arrows that are going from the data level to the models very much, in most cases, are pointing up towards the model. So the other thing that I think that's happened is that instead of going and doing a redundant process, which is in kind of the classic scientific way, we actually are in a, much more involved in induction in terms of inferring and building these models based on the data sets that we have available or that are in front of us, as opposed to going through more of an inductive process. And so that allows us, those practices allow us to restrict what we do down at these bottom levels. Um, if you look at model three or four, there's a couple of examples where the model may feed back into or um, inspire a new effort at data collection. And so I don't want to say that that never happens, but I think more often than not, everything is driven up from the bottom. And that can be useful for a lot of things. I think the other thing that then we have with this is that our generalizability um, then becomes a vertical instead of a horizontal. And so we may be able to have a great model, and we may have a data set that has millions of users represented, and we may feel pretty good that whatever we, the model we create generalizes to people at that particular instance in time. But the extent to which it generalizes over time to other situations five years from now, ten years from now, is very questionable. Um, so I think that's the other thing that's been happening in our research is that our, fo our focus is on generalizability at a vertical as opposed to a horizontal. So to kind of reflect on these the theoretical and symbolic labels that I just shared with you, um, and this is, is going to hopefully not be too uh, pedantic to some folks in here, but I just wanted to kind of review some of this language because again I recognize that everyone may not have had formal training um, in our class on theory development, been lucky enough uh, to have such things. So uh, just as kind of a, a step back, a theory is a set of statements about the relationships between two or more concepts or constructs. And you'll kind of see where I'm going with this in just a minute. So this idea of concepts and constructs are really important. Um, it's a conceptual system which gives concrete expression to our ideas using some external symbolic system. So again, and then we might think about math, we may think about some sort of model um, that we build, or words. The external system forms a communication function and allows for deeper scrutiny and helps coordinate our efforts as scientists. And then we can think about a theoretical expression as any external symbolic representation of an internal conceptual system that a particular researcher has. And theoretical expressions could include things like um, models, hypotheses, and theories. So I'm kind of lumping all of those things together uh, in this talk. And in, in terms of hypotheses, actually, some can be very specific, derived concretely uh, from a specific theory, while other hypotheses are more of the form, my system is better, or this will work. Uh, so those, are, those show up in different ways. But the real important thing is to think about this conceptual system um, and these theoretical expressions. And so we'll kind of look at that. Um, the concepts, of course, are things that are in our mind. Um, and people create concepts all the time to make sense of the world. You don't have to be a scientist to do that. Uh, thank goodness. And that's basically how people are able to function in the world uh, from the time that they're born um, all the way through, the, through, through their lives. 
by learning concepts and categorizations um, for different things, labels for different things that people have given them. And so we need to do this as well when we're setting up experiments and research. Uh, and also remember that they're hypothetical and reality oriented. So the concept should in some way be tied to or mapped to something in the real world, something that's observable, a click, a, a, the passage of time, um, somebody screaming, somebody circling a number on a form to describe how they feel about something. Those are all reality oriented events um, that these constructs should be tied to. They can also be clustered to form larger uh, constructs. And some constructs you can even think about as actual variables, so how we are actually going to go about measuring these things. So the empirical label is the, the bottom layer, or layer, is the bottom, bottom one there. And that's, again, the one that I think we spend the most time on. Uh, and here, you want to think about this correspondence of fit between what's at the top layer and even the middle layer with what's at the bottom layer. And again, the, what's at the bottom layer is the thing that we really, as scientists, able to critique each other on. That's where, presumably, we should be aiming if we're thinking about reproducibility and replicability. That's what we can see. That's what's visible to us. Um, so it's very hard to evaluate, and, or impossible really, to evaluate somebody's theoretical ideas unless they're instantiated somehow at this empirical le um, level. So it, it, the thing I put here at the bottom is just, again, this kind of observation that it's not clear um, if a lot of the empirical data that we collect, that we're really good at collecting and analyzing, really has any kind of correspondence to any type of conceptual system. We do have a lot of concepts in our field, and so these are ones you may have struggled with yourself to think about what do they mean, like relevance, usefulness, utility, engagement, credibility, difficulty, confidence, satisfaction, diversity. So I've just listed a few um, that come to my mind. But we deal with concepts all the time. The, one of the challenges, though, is that very few of these concepts are, are actually ever defined by anyone. We just take it as they're either primitive, and in some fields you do have the privilege of having primitive concepts that don't have to be defined. But we tend to treat everything in our field as some kind of primitive concept that doesn't require our defining it in any kind of way, even in the most rudimentary way of going and grabbing a dictionary and saying, what does this mean? What do I mean by engagement? What do I mean by satisfaction? What do I mean by relevance? What do I mean by usefulness? We just take it as a given that somehow we're all thinking about the same kind of thing uh, when we use these concepts. There's also a lot of properties in IR, so we care about properties of the system, properties of the user, properties of the information objects, properties of the task and information needs and intents, properties of society and culture, properties of uh, use situations and environments. So there's a whole bunch of things that we try to stuff into the things that we're developing or building or testing, um, but again, we often don't have any sort of shared conceptual system or framework for what these things are. There's also a, a lack of standardization when it comes to measuring these things. We do have a lot of measures, um, and some of them are for performance, so I showed you RVP earlier. Uh, we have MDCG, Precision and Recall. You can fill in the, you know, keep listing all of those many, many, many measures that have been developed over time. We also use things like number of clicks, number of queries, number of page views, query length, um, time to task, task difficulty. So there's all these kinds of, again, empirical things, events, um, that we use and then we collect to demonstrate different things. But very often these things are actually not linked back to any kind of concept. And then that creates, it creates a situation uh, where we're really not able to compare our work to other people, where we're not really able to, again, accrete knowledge over time or accumulate knowledge over time, because what I mean by task difficulty may be totally different from what you mean by task difficulty, but we've not defined it, so it doesn't, we will never know. Um, all we've done is said how we're going to measure it. My version of relevance may be very different than your version of relevance, but again, usually is missing um, in any work. Uh, we just take that for granted. And so what this means is we, we basically, in our field, I think, inflated these two processes of conceptualization and operationalization. And what happens when you do that 
is that every time you create a measure without conceptualizing it, that is the conceptualization of the measure. So every small change in the measure means you've created another concept, whether you realize it or not. And so then we have this kind of proliferation of concepts um, around these sets of measures that we use. One example, um, that, that, or two examples here, one is to think about, again, task complexity, which is something that a lot of people are interested in, but people measure it in very different ways. Some people may measure it as a property of the task itself. Some people may think of it more like task difficulty, some an experience the person has in trying to address the task. Um, some people um, um, measure it by using instruments like self-report instruments. Some people measure it in, in a kind of more objective fashion by analyzing features of the task. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different ways we approach that. You can also think about the uh, uh, situation where we have the same measures or signals that are meant to measure the very different things. A lot of times things that are totally opposite of one another. So you can find work now that will tell you that number of clicks equals engagement. You can also find work that tells you number of clicks equals frustration. How is it that this one observation means all these things that are things that are very different from one another? Display time. Oh, that means the person's interested. They're engaged. Oh, display time. Well, that's bad. That means it's a failure. The person's struggling, right? So th these are just a couple of examples, but that and then creates a situation where every time somebody decides to measure something in some kind of way, they're measuring it in a study-specific way, and then ultimately we really don't know what number of clicks means. And number of clicks, it's actually relative, because it depends on what the person is trying to do, what type of system the person is trying to use um, to accomplish those goals. And, but without a specification of that up front, it really is hard to interpret and hard to compare across study. And again, that's sort of where the, the theory part starts coming in. So we do spend a lot of our time at this empirical level, and then some of our time as well at the symbolic level. We do a great job of building systems. We do a great job of collecting data. We do a pretty good job, although we might disagree, of running statistical tests. Um, we are you know, happy to apply that. But that's all kind of working in the empirical realm. And so a lot of these models, again, that we have that are at the symbolic level are actually built uh, from the bottom up as opposed to, again, from the top down, which is a, the traditional model. The other thing we do is we value prediction over explanation, um, which is, you know, fine, but that's going to um, um, make it difficult to uh, um, accommodate and develop theory. What this chart is from, this is from a, an article that is a really great article by Shumuli that was published in 2010, um, and she was looking at um, big data. Um, and I think she had another paper that was something like too big to fail, which is really great as well. But what she was studying and looking at and explaining is that there's really, at least if you think about the descriptive level, the predictive level, and the explanatory level, there's kind of two ways of going about research that we see, especially when folks are having access and analyzing large data sets as they might um, um, if they're in industry or, or in, in even in academia, people often have more access to large data sets. So when we're predicting, we really are focused on the little f, and the little f just means that, that this particular instance of the f, as opposed to the big f, which is more the, the idea or truth behind the f, that's the theory. So the big f is the, the theory that explains this over multiple um, episodes across time. The sampling procedures for the predicting part it typically emphasizes a big N to lower the variance. There's a lot of noise in the data, so you need that big N to get rid of that. Um, you have population level parameters that you're working with because you often have not, not a sample, but every, every instance in there. Um, with sampling, when it comes to explanatory studies, typically you're using something called statistical power to be able to, for example, estimate how many uh, participants you might need if you're doing a study um, or if you're doing a survey, estimate how many um, survey responses you need. So you're using a completely different set of tools in order to um, decide how to do sampling. The settings are different too in, in the prediction area. Typically it's observational and then again there's lots of noise, but the good thing is there's lots of realism. It's real data, it's live action, it's what people are doing uh, versus experimental setup 
uh, where it's a little bit more clean, a little bit more controlled, and a little bit more artificial. The measurement um, is also important as well as the, the variables, and, and I point that out because measurement and variables both in the predictive column focus on what's there, okay? And that again, thinking back to that lower level where we're building up from the data, it's what's there in the data. The researcher is not necessarily able to go outside of what's in the data set in order to think about, wouldn't it be neat to measure this? Or what if a person is doing this? Or what if I do this? What if I could add this kind of variable to my data set? It's restricted on what is being collected. And it may be collected as a function of what features the system has um, and what's being logged in the system. But you're restricted to that as opposed to, again, thinking ahead of time what it is you want to measure and then designing a study that allows you to collect all of those different measures. The model evaluation um, also is different. One is focused on prediction accuracy, so seeing how, how good uh, the model predicts um, future events. Um, and then the model evaluation for ex explanatory research is focused more on explanatory power, so explaining what's going on. And, and I should point out that, of course, you don't need to understand what's going on to predict something, right? You can do a lot of prediction and do a really good job without really knowing what's going on. So prediction and explanation are not the same thing. Prediction is, is good, it helps you reach an explanation at some point, but you don't need to explain to predict. And then the analysis, analytical procedures, typically with a, a column focused on predict, or prediction is machine learning types of techniques and then explanatory uses um, statistical theory. So that's another, I think, reason why we, again, see a lot less work at that top layer. Um, another reason, I think, um, is that we value right now applied research over basic, and I don't think it's just us. I think that's uh, in my academic institution more and more, uh, where people are very much focused on um, engagement and research that makes a difference. And I'm not saying anything negative about that because it is important to do research that, that sort of has a real world impact. Uh, but it's also important, I think, to do research because you, you have a field to look after, you have scholarship to look after, uh, and that is often not emphasized as much. And so I'm guessing most people, well, I'm going to guess that. I have seen something like this on papers that I have submitted. What's the practical value of all this? What does it mean? What does it mean for practice? I don't care what it means for practice. It's probably not an acceptable answer. But you never see people say, what is the theoretical significance of this work? How does this work actually expand our understanding of phenomena X? Reviewers never say that, right? That's not a required section in the papers we write. The other one is a required section, implicit in the papers we write. And so, again, one is not better than the, the other. It's just an observation that there's a whole lot of one, but not a lot of the other. Um, and so that kind of drives how we set up our work practices. Um, the applied, of course, is conducted for the purposes of solving real-world problems, why the basic is focused more on expanding the boundaries of what we know about a particular field. Um, the applied is concerned with relatively narrow and circumscribed concepts that are domain-specific. So if you have a tool that does X, then here that's the domain, and you have these are your concerns. If you have a tool that does Y, then you have other set of concerns. Versus basic research where your domain's a lot broader. And then, of course, we have the fine difference in the findings where we have findings that are produced uh, to extend the, that are not extended necessarily, that are not generated to extend the body of knowledge we have, whereas basic they are. And, there's a lot of reasons, too, I think, of why we have an emphasis on applied. I think it's great. One is, of course, that many of us are training researchers who are going to go work in industry, and so they're going to be doing applied research. And so it's really important in our educational system that we emphasize the techniques that are going to help them be successful in the workplace. Um, we don't spend a lot of time, though, um, teaching students how to build theory or how to think theoretically about things. And so I think that's another issue in terms of why there may be deficiencies in the amount of theory we have in 
about folks working on basic research, even people who work in academic institutions who do have a little bit more of a luxury to work on basic research, um, often don't because they also are getting signals that apply is the way to go. I have a little hamster wheel here that you see that, that uh, people will often present as a reason why they can't do basic research in an academic institution because, well, performance evaluations. You've got to produce X number of papers in order to get your raise, to get your promotion, to get your positive review. So lots of us are in systems that encourage us to stay in that empirical realm because it's easier to turn out publications if we're in that empirical realm. It's much harder because the work that's at the theoretical level takes a lot longer to do. Um, and so again, the incentive structure is set up such that um, we may choose not to work up there. And then of course, the more we do something, the more we do it, right? So what we're, we're practiced at, what we're good at, is what we continue to stick with. So just to kind of summarize this section, um, I want to point out that both the conceptual and empirical realm are necessary uh, in any kind of research. And you actually can't have one without the other. Um, although we do have a lot of work that is at the empirical realm, it doesn't come out of nowhere. There are concepts and ideas that are driving people's choices and decisions. They just may or may not be explicit. Um, they, they may stay latent. Um, but the idea here is just that ignoring or suppressing the theoretical level is not necessarily going to be helpful in terms of developing our knowledge base. So with this, I want to kind of transition to sort of the second part um, of this talk. So I think in here, you know, what I wanted to do in the first part was sort of review some of the different theory in our field, how it shows up, how it looks, and then kind of have this bird's eye perspective on some of the things I think um, that are going on in our field that prevent us from having a lot of work at that top level. What I want to do now is kind of go through an exercise in theoretical modeling. Um, and don't worry, this doesn't require you to raise your hand or anything like that. So this isn't necessarily audience participation. If you're in the front and you're getting nervous, um, it's, not, it's not like that. Uh, but what I've done is kind of prepared a whole bunch of examples uh, for us to kind of think about in terms of trying to think theoretically about something. So how would we approach problems theoretically? And even I have a hard time doing it. I'm actually, I'm an experimentalist. I love collecting data, analyzing data, just like everybody else. Um, so. Part of it is, is actually training ourselves to think about things in a different way. So we might have something like this. So how does the number of documents viewed, which again is very much at the empirical level, it's a, an observation we could make in the real world, how does that affect something called user confidence? Okay, that's a construct. What do we mean by user confidence? Hopefully everybody's asking that right now. What do you mean by that? Did you define that? Um, how are you going to measure that? But for now, let's just imagine we have some great way to measure this. So if we're starting to think about what is this relationship, we might first kind of go through these thought experiments where we think, well, maybe it's a linear relationship, right? Maybe as the number of documents a person views increases, so does their confidence. That's a pretty simple model, right? And we could create some nice um, formula to describe that relationship. Oh, or maybe not, right? Maybe it's something different is going on. Maybe it starts to increase. If it doesn't increase, it takes a, a little bit to increase, then it increases pretty sharply, and then it flattens off again. And so you only have certain gains you can make, so maybe it looks more like this S-curve. Or maybe it's more like a step function, right? Maybe there's a specific inflection point where a person is going around, they're viewing documents, viewing documents, and they don't have a lot of confidence, and then all of a sudden they reach some you know, invisible number of documents, um, and there suddenly their confidence shoots all the way up to the top, and then it stays up at the top. Or maybe it looks more like this, right? So you start viewing a few documents, but then you get overwhelmed. There's too many confidence decreases, and then you sort of get your bearings, and your confidence increases. Um, so maybe it, that the relationship actually looks like this. Or maybe it looks like this, right? So these are all different ways that this relationship could look. Um, and again, if you think about questions that interest you, one thing to start thinking theoretically, help you start thinking theoretically about that is actually to think about what the relationship would actually look like. And of course, you can add more and more variables, and you no longer have the, the beauty of using these 
um, nice di uh, two-dimensional representations, but it's a great way to really question your assumptions about what you think is going on. Now, one of the things you may be thinking is, well, wait a minute, I mean, there's like a whole lot of things that could impact this relationship. It's a pretty basic thing, right? Maybe it depends on other factors like what tasks they're trying to do. So maybe if a person's doing a fact-finding task, the relationship is linear, but if they're doing another kind of task, the relationship looks different, like an information finding task or a decision task, right? So we can start actually adding more and more concepts into our theoretical model, which is what we've just done by adding one more thing in there. And then we might again think about something that looks like this, um, two different curves, depending on what the person is trying to do, what task the person is trying to do. And in this case, we would actually talk about something like task type moderating this relationship. So this diagram that you see here is actually something called a path um, diagram. It's very common in behavioral sciences to actually do these theoretical exercises where you're trying to think through and model and display what your theory is. And so in this case, we're thinking about Z as being the moderator, changing the relationship between how many documents a person views and the confidence that they have afterwards. Now, it could actually get even more complicated because maybe you say, well, wait a minute, Diane, maybe what if the person has no concept of fact-finding and informational or decision tasks? Like those are just made up weird things that researchers think about, right? Just concepts. They have no meaning to people in the real world. So maybe you say it's actually not that. Maybe it's actually whether the person realizes that the person has some expectation about how many documents they should find based on what it is they're looking for. And that's going to influence how confident they are. So what you see here is a, another uh, variable that's added to the model or another construct that's added to the model that helps to try to explain the relationship that we're trying to study. And in this case, we would call that a mediated moderator. Um, the cue there would be the person's understanding or ideas about expectations about how many documents they should find. Z is still the actual task type that the person is doing. And so, again, we can start seeing that these models can get really complicated. Um, here are some more. Uh, we have something called moderated moderation. And then the other one is called partial mediated moderation. Now, I wish I could say that everybody who does user studies um, uses these kind of models, but they don't either. So when I'm standing up here, please don't think, oh, everybody that, that, that does user studies or interactive IR, um, they, they do all of these nice exercises ahead of time. They don't, typically. Uh, and, and so the same problem, problems exist. We also have these types of models that we can use to think about uh, what's going on uh, in, in IR situations. And I think this particular one is really good because one of the things that's really hard to study in IR is, the, it is one of the things that makes IR hard to study is that it is a dynamic interactive process. It can't be limited to just a slice in time. So there are these models that are called reciprocal causality models. And the models are really clear to say that there's something always comes before something else. So it's not that they're completely reciprocal, but based on your time scale, you may not be able to observe this happening and that happening. When we view our picture of a search interaction happening, at that point it's really hard to see each time a person enters a query, looks at a document, um, that has some change on a lot of things like their confidence and other kinds of um, features that we may be interested in studying. So the reciprocal causation is typically represented in this kind of way where you would have um, first search interaction, second search interaction. And so again, it's a dynamic process that you're um, studying. And, and oftentimes, we stick with these static models uh, which don't account for this interaction that's happening. The other kind that's fun is something called feedback loop. So this is also part of this idea that search is interactive and dynamic. And the example I have here uh, is actually related to the keynote yesterday, so where we learned about this, this agent that you could chat with. Um, so we have these a lot. Lots of people are interested in conversational um, retrieval and assistance. Now, if you're like me and you've ever used one of these, usually this is what I'm looking like when I'm using one, um, because usually the agent does not understand what I'm saying. 
Um, and so we could model something like that. We could think about a measure like number of errors, which again, what does that mean? We would need to say that, but we could think about number of errors um, causes or has an impact on user frustration, which in turn causes the user to use more curse words or have more what's called conversational disfluencies. Um, and then that in turn feeds back and causes the system to have more errors, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we study that we could, again, theoretically model in this kind of way uh, as a feedback loop. There are also models that show temporal dynamics. Um, and temporal dynamics uh, are longitudinal models that allow us to see how things change from one time to the next and also how things carry over. Um, and the carryover effects that these models are called lag effects. And so you can see them drawn on, I think, the EDF lines there. And so at, the, at time one, which is this first um, side here, where you've got X and Y, you have one thing causing something else or causing changes in something else. And then another instance in time, you have the same relationship that you observe. And what this model is showing is that not only do you have these contemporane contemporaneous effects, which is just the one you might normally study in a single slice, but you have these effects that are autoregressive over time. Um, because when the, the person's experience that they have at that first time is going to impact their experience they have at a second time. And you can imagine, I just put some concepts up there so you can kind of think about what, is this, what does this mean. You can think about something like search success at time one and how that might impact a person's search self-efficacy, which is a construct that some people study. Um, and then you can think about time passing and then how that experience and that search self-efficacy is going to be carried over and have an impact at the, on that relationship at the next point in time. In This is another way that we look at theory or theoretical tools that are used in behavioral sciences um, is through something called structural equation modeling. So these models can actually get really complicated. What this shows you again is each of the little squares represent some sort of construct that's being measured and modeled. The arrows represent the relationships among those constructs. And I showed you before there are a lot of different types of relationships that you can model like moderators, moderator, moderator. Um, moderated mediator, mediators, etc. And then you can see the error terms that are associated, associated with each of these constructs. And what these uh, models do is they'll actually allow you to create a series of formulas that describe all of these um, relationships, which I've just sort of shown you off here to the left. One real world example we actually have an expert in the room on structural equation modeling, um, Anita Crescenzi. Anita, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Um, so Anita uh, is, a, is almost finished, not a student anymore at UNC, uh, and she did a really great thing in our lab, which is introduce us to this idea, well, us, my old us, my previous us, um, introduced the team when I was there to this approach to actually doing modeling, uh, because before we were using very different statistical tools, but she was fortunate enough to be able to study uh, with one of sort of the most known people, uh, Ken Bowen, who, who created structural equation modeling. So we were really lucky to have that. So for all the students in the room, you can innovate your lab as well by going out and learning some new tricks like this um, and help. So what this is, she shared this model with me. This is actually a, a much more complex model. The things that are in ovals are latent constructs. And then the things that are in the squares, the green, that have the green text and the blue text, are measures of those latent constructs. So you have the theory represented by the ovals, then the actual operationalization, if you will, represented by the square boxes. So each one of those things in the square boxes is a specific measure. And then you have um, some other things in the middle, which are observables. Again, those are kind of those measures we all use, but we often don't talk about what do they actually mean. Things like time on task, number of clicks. So to wrap up, that's a lot. Um, and in that section, again, I just really wanted to kind of walk you through a bunch of different ways that you could think about things from a theoretical perspective and introduce you to some techniques that would allow you to start really trying to break down the things that you're studying um, into more precise pieces. 
Uh, I think a lot of times we study the whole system, this whole, and it ends up becoming this big black box that we're studying. And so we don't really know what's going on inside. And maybe we're totally fine only knowing how many errors are made. Maybe that's all we care about. Or how many conversational interactions that the two people had to have. Maybe that's all we care about. That may be fine for production level things, but if, again, if we're thinking about that top level of developing theory for our field, then we want to think about um, doing a little more. So some suggestions here for generating um, theory. The first is to be creative. That sounds kind of lame, but it's true. Um, is to really try to think outside the box, think about things, and try to think about things from a completely different angle and how you usually approach those the things. Read past literature, especially older classics, as they are great sources for inspiration and ideas that actually never got tested because maybe the technology wasn't there to test out the ideas, but now is a great time to go back and test out some of those ideas. The other nice thing about past literature is that you're going to find a lot more examples of people writing about theory and about theoretical constructs because in the past uh, you could get your papers published if you wrote about that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's great that this conference exists as well as Cheers, another great conference that um, is a lot more open to um, accepting uh, things that are um, um, theory that may or may not have any kind of empirical layer to them. Uh, probe and tinker with assumptions, so expose hidden assumptions, make the opposite assumption, simultaneously trust and doubt the same assumption, and see how that helps you think about your problem in a different way. Failure analysis is also a great way to start building a theory when you're really studying and trying to figure out what went wrong. If you typically focus on variables, then focus on process. If you typically focus on process, focus on variables. <coughs> You can also change the scale. If you typically look at things in aggregate, narrow down into a slice. A single person, a single instance, a single day, a single type of query. And then you can also think about shifting the unit of analysis. So instead of looking, for example, at a person, you might look at a pair of people. Or you, instead of looking at a single query, you might look at a set of queries or a set of search sessions. So think about what level we're actually um, doing the analysis on. And Shane, here's your slide because I really enjoyed Shane's presentation yesterday. But and it made it so it was another great example though of how we can go further. So in Shane's um, presentation yesterday of uh, the work that he and others did, and I just picked one of your formulas. Sorry, I may not have picked the right one uh, to put on there. He said fusion can't be beat. That was the message I got from him loud and clear. And then I wrote a note and I thought, well, I want why? So why is fusion shift so good, right? And so we could keep pushing this. Now it has this great finding. So then I'm sure there's a lot of theories of language production, for example, uh, that might help explain why fusion is so good, why fused queries are so good. So don't be satisfied with just finding that something is better than something else, but really ask this why question. Why is it? And when you think about why, don't, don't think about it in a way that Shane could say, well, the reason it's this way, Diane, is because you put these numbers in this formula and that's how it works out. Right? That's not the why, that's the how. So you really want to think about why is it that fused queries in this example um, work best? What is it about again, language production or something that makes that a, a, a good solution? And maybe he have, will have an answer for us next year. So this is my final thought here. Um, I want to close. Uh, and this is, a, this is a quote, but I just thought I would end with this quote. Uh, it is vital that researchers clarify and systematize their conceptual frameworks. They should scrutinize the meaning of key concepts, specify relationships among concepts, and write a concept paper. Please, write a concept paper. Uh, devoting time to expanding and ordering one's conceptual frame can seem like a frivolous diversion from more pressing task, and certainly may not get you promoted faster. Uh, but the payoffs can be substantial. Uh, and, and then he ends by saying, properly developed, a fresh idea can have a lasting impact. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks for the extremely interesting talk. Um, we have time for a few questions. Just raise your hand. Uh, 
So early, excuse me, early in the talk you mentioned you had there were some examples of theories that didn't necessarily lead to uh, good hypotheses. Is that would you consider a theory that doesn't lead to good hypotheses a good theory? No. Um, there's actually, and I think I said this in the abstract, so I was like, oh, I didn't manage to squeeze that into the talk, but um, if a theory is not testable, then it's not a good theory. So there are some some sort of criteria for evaluating the goodness or quality of a theory, and that's that's kind of number one on the list, is that it has to be testable. I, so it's interesting um, to contrast this. In my previous field, um, we were very long on theory and very short on experimental observation. So it's just interesting to see this from the other side. What field was that? Uh, string theory. <laughs> Hi, very nice talk. Um, uh, one question is that um, I have uh, the kind of impression that when we do not create theory ourselves, information retrieval, theory comes from outside. So there's been, uh, for example, right now, there's a lot of people using neural networks, okay? They use it, they use it, they don't really, to be honest, explain much theory, but, you know, they show great results. Before that, uh, there was something else, probabilistic modeling, before that there was, uh, I don't know, other and others, you know, there were waves of, uh, of things like this that, that happen and then disappear, okay? So what do you think of this? Do you think they leave a trace? They leave something that we can build on? Uh, or do we just have to expect that, you know, the next wave or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I would like to be in a field where there are things that last. Um, but it takes people doing that work, and, it, and that takes the right incentive structures, right, for people to do that work. Um, I think that we also have to, you know, again, um, um, pay attention to these, these kind of theoretical ideas or, or ways of working. Um, it's hard for me to think about those completely as like theoretical ideas versus just ways of going about your work or modeling what you're doing. Uh, so we have to pay attention to those as well and certainly educate students about those techniques if those techniques are what's going to get them a job. But I do think that that longer lasting layer that kind of horizontal layer of generalizability is pretty thin for us right now. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was really interesting. Um, I have a question about, I think a follow up question on this. So, uh, as researchers in IR, I think now uh, like a lot of us read papers in machine learning and maybe natural language processing, follow conferences like URIX or ACL. Do you recommend following other research fields, like you mentioned social sciences? Like what other conferences fields we should follow to get new ideas, uh, fresh ideas? Um, I, I mean, I think things like um, what I've been surprised about. So I'm actually in a uh, college of communication and information. This is a long answer to your question, I guess, but. Um, and we have a school of advertising and public relations, and this, the, everybody, almost every discipline now, they have computer scientists doing something, right? And they're coming in there, and a lot of them are trained with, with the theory, right? And so they're actually applying these really interesting theoretical perspectives from, you know, sociology, political science, other disciplines, communication theory, to large data sets. Um, and so I think that those areas are really great areas to read from that literature in order to try to um, think about what that means for our field, what that means for information access systems. Yeah. But it is pretty amazing. I mean, computer scientists are taking over the world, academic institutions anyway, at least mine, which is okay with me.